Watch your step, grab a seat. Please make sure we're at the fort, secure the dock, and the captain gives you all clear to go ashore. Right. Now, please, no smoking on board the boat or the fort. And remember, this fort is made of coquina. Coquina is an extremely soft stone, a very porous rock. So please, no food or drink at the fort except for water. If you're drinking a coffee, a Coke, a Gatorade over there, you trip and you drop it, it's going to soak into the walls of the fort. We can't get it back out. We're worried about we're worried that the rats and crabs that live in the fort, they come out at night, they're going to smell that stuff in the walls, start taking the walls apart to get it out. So once again, please, no food or drink at the fort except for water. I also mentioned coquina is very soft. So please, for your safety, as well as for the preservation of the fort, please don't sit on the walls of the fort. They are wearing away. Please don't sit on the guns, they're dangerous. Cannons can move. If the barrel cannon moves, your hand goes under the barrel, your hand may not be coming back out from under that gun. We all are going to get ready to board. As we do board, I'm going to count boarding passes you all go by. Please have those out. If you have a string of boarding passes, please make sure the first person in your party has a string and the entire party is together. If it's a really long string, let me know who the last person in the party is. And let's get ready to board. <laughs> So welcome aboard everybody. My name is Paul and I'll be your captain on this trip. Here's Ranger Steve. He'll be your guide and our deck hands. <clears throat> life jackets are overhead for adults, children's life jackets in this box up front here. Uh, these are just for emergencies. You don't have to wear them, but we just want to point out where they are. So that said, the main safety rule is that you stay seated at all times, whether we're tied up or underway. So if you're on the boat, we ask that you stay seated. So thanks for helping us out with that safety rule and sit back, relax, welcome aboard. Ready to cast off. Again, welcome to Fort Matanzas here on Rattlesnake Island. Now we're going to head on over to the shady side of the fort over here, gather up near the walls of the fort, and I'm going to tell you all a story about the place. Along the way, we pass by the little fiddler crab colony. So, sick little guys, please don't step on it. You guys ready? Please follow me on up. Just want to step on the ramp on the dock here. Yeah, I know where they are.
over here in the shade. Oh, that's another guy there. Man, they're all over the place. I'm not sure I step on it. All right, y'all. Welcome again to Fort McCann. Fort McCann's once again. I'm Ranger Steve. Now I have I have four stories. Four stories about the fort, about the area, spanning 350 years of our history here. Now I'm going to tell y'all at least one of these stories. I can tell you all four if you want, but that means we're not going up in the fort today. So y'all choose which story you want to hear. Now story number one goes way on back to the 1500s. That's how this area got its name, Matanzas. Stories two and three are from the 1700s. Story number two, why did the Spanish build this fort here? Story number three, how they build the fort here? And story number four is from the early 1900s, how the War Department and the National Park Service created this national monument for us. So show of hands, who would like to know how this area got its name, Matanzas? Who wants that? All right, we're off to an early lead here, good. How about why did the Spanish build this fort here? Still looks like Matanzas, hey, by nose there. How about, um, how did they build the fort here? Still Matanzas? And then the War Department and National Park Service created this national monument. Looks like I'm going to tell you all how the area got its name, Matanzas. Now, if you want to hear about any of the other stories we're up in the fort, just give me a yell. I'll let you know about those up there. So we're going to go way on back, late 14, early 1500s. The Europeans, the Spanish, have, much to the chagrin of the folks already living on this side of the world, they have discovered the New World, Central and South America, the Aztec, the Mayan, the Incan empires. Now, what did the Spanish take from those folks that brought them back again and again? What did they take from the Aztecs and Incans? Gold, silver, and chocolate. You're absolutely right. Load your ships full of gold, silver, and chocolate. Hit the high seas. Who's coming after you? Pirates. Remember pirates. They're going to come into our story in a little bit. Wait, any of y'all going to Florida? Any of y'all going to Florida? Yeah. All right. You guys going to Florida? You guys dig holes in the backyard? Yeah, no. You got it. You do. Yeah. Good. Excellent. Great job. You need, you need to dig more holes back there. Not growing up. You dig holes in the backyard. All right. How much gold have y'all found? <laughs> God, oh man, yeah, my siblings and I, same thing. We dug holes all over the backyard. Our folks yelled at us, we dug more holes back there. We never found any gold either. We don't have any gold here in Florida. What we have is a super highway back to Spain, the Gulf Stream. All those ships full of gold, silver, and chocolate are coming off the Spanish Main, squeezing between the Bahamas, Florida, coming right up the coast here on the way back to Spain. 1513 comes along, Juan Ponce Leon swings on by, and once again, much to the chagrin of the Tamuquans and the other folks who've been living around here for 12,000 years, he discovers La Florida, the land of flowers. Now, back in those days, Florida goes north, all the way up towards what's now Canada. Heads west, out to the Mississippi River. So all that Europe knows what's going to become North America is Spanish La Florida. Now, the French didn't read that memo, so we get some issues over there in Europe. The Protestant Reformation is going on over there. In the 1560s, some of those Protestants in France, Huguenots, show up on some ships, sail on over, and they land about 50, 60 miles north of us on the St. John's River near present-day Jacksonville. They build a wooden fort up there. They don't find more gold than we did. Some of the guys get impatient, jump on some ships, then try to hand them a common pirates. Well, they didn't become very good pirates because they get caught right off the bat. King Philippe of Spain, one of his worst fears. He now has French pirates on the off the coast of Florida, or on the coast of Florida here, threatening his treasure fleet. He calls that little fleet Pedro Menendez in the office. Admiral Menendez, I have a job for you. I need you to rid my land of these French invaders. Now, Menendez has been trying to get over here to the New World for a while. One of his sons is a sea captain over here, and he has been lost at sea, shipwrecked in a storm, possibly off the coast of Florida. So, Menendez has been trying to get over here for a while, so he can start searching for his son. So he takes the king up on that offer, he gets the Spanish fleet together, and they prepare for their trip to the New World. Meanwhile, that French colony up there, Fort Caroline, on the St. John's River, they are not doing very well. They have barely survived the winter of 1564. Jean Rabot is taking the French fleet back to France to get new supplies, to get reinforcements. So you have the French fleet under France, under Rabot in France, Spanish fleet under Menendez in Spain, both fleets leave Europe about the same time, racing across the Atlantic to get over here first. Menendez, he needs to get here first. He needs to destroy that French fort before it can be reinforced. Rabot needs to get here first. He needs to reinforce the fort before the Spanish arrive. These guys are both really good sailors. They're racing across the Atlantic. Storms come, storms go. Menendez's fleet gets spread out a little bit. And Rabot wins the race. The day he lands at Fort Caroline, 
Menendez with one of the other ships sights Cape Canaveral north south where the space center is nowadays and they start looking for French guys. They poke their head mesquite inlet down there. Nope, there's no French guys in there. They look in here. There's no French guys in here. They go up to the town of Saloy, which is now St. Augustine. They look on in there. There's just a Tamukwin village. There's no French guys in there. So they go all the way up to the St. John's River. Not only do they find French guys in there, there's that French fort. There's that French fleet. Orders, orders. Menendez goes in, guns a blazing. He comes back out, guns a blazing. It's too well defended. He cannot take that fort. He retreats south to Saloy to try to figure out what to do. The king has ordered him to destroy that French colony, but it's too well defended. What can he do? Some of the Tamukwans come up. You mean that place up there? We walk up there all the time. We can show you how to walk on up there. He says, that's what we'll do then. If I can't take it by sea, I will take it by land. So he prepares his men to march north on the Fort Caroline. Meanwhile, Rabot is getting his men back on the ship. They are going to sa sail south to attack the Spanish in Saloy before they get before they get organized. So you have Menendez and his men preparing to march north on the Fort Caroline. Rabot and his men sailing south to attack the Spanish in Saloy, and that's when the hand of fate steps in. A giant storm comes in off the Atlantic. A hurricane smashes into Rabot's fleet, drives them south, sinks every ship. Hundreds drown, the rest make it ashore in two groups, one around Daytona, one around Canaveral, and they start walking north along the beaches to get back to Fort Caroline. Meanwhile, Rabot and his men, they're marching north on to Fort Caroline. These guys have the old matchlock muskets, the muskets will be some rope they have to keep lit. They're marched through the swamps, trying to keep a match lit, trying to keep their powder dry, and the storm hits them. But it's so fierce, they will get right to the walls of the fort before the French even know they're there. So they kill all the soldiers. They capture the women, children, send them to Puerto Rico. They take the fort, leave a small detachment, and Menendez's men return south to Saloy. The day they get back to Saloy, some of the Tamukwans come and say, hey, we've just seen some white men down there beyond the end of the island across the inlet. So Menendez gets his men back together. They march out here to the inlet. There's a group of Frenchmen from Daytona. They're bedraggled. They're starving. They can't get across the inlet. It's too deep. The current's too swift. Menendez sends a boat over. A French envoy gets in. They roll him back over. He gets out. He says, Admiral Menendez, we will lay down our arms. We'll surrender if you spare us our lives. And he says, I hear what you say. I will do whatever God tells me to do. So the French have run out of options at this point. The boat goes back across. 10 to 12 Frenchmen get in. They roll them back on over. They get out. Menendez has their hands bound behind their backs. They march them up the dunes where he has scratched a line in the sand. They step across that line. The soldiers fall on them and cut their throats. The boat goes back across. 10 to 12 more, 10 to 12 more, 10 to 12 more, 10 to 12 more. The priest from St. Augustine has been chronicling all this, and he has convinced Menendez to spare about 16. Some are professed Catholics. Others are British sailors who have been captured. Others are artisans. They may be for the new colony, but they kill everyone else, and they return to Saloy. About two weeks later, they hear there's more white men down here. They come on back down. Here's the group of Frenchmen from, from Canaveral, Rabot amongst them. The same thing happens. The boat goes over 10 to 12, 10 to 12, 10 to 12, 10 to 12. By the time this is all over, they've spared about 32, maybe three dozen. But we have 250 Frenchmen lying dead in the dunes over here. And that's where the area takes its name from Matanzas. Spanish for massacres, for slaughters. Say, man, that's cold. Why? Why did Menendez have to kill him? They were going to lay down their arms. They were going to surrender. Why did he have to kill him? Well, number one, the king told him to. That was his orders. I need you to rid my land of those French invaders. Number two, God told him to. Menendez is fervently Catholic from the land of the Spanish Inquisition. These Huguenots, they may as well have been saint worshippers as far as the Catholics are concerned. But number three, Menendez is here at the inlet. He's looking across, and he's counting mouths, and he's counting mouths, and he's counting mouths. If he spares that 250, bring them back to the new colony, has to pull the soldiers from clearing fields and growing food for people to guard them 24 7, he may be sentencing his own people to a slow death by starvation over the upcoming winter. So chances are, while he's here at the inlet, it's number three. He doesn't have enough supplies to feed an extra 250 mouths 
before it's applied and come back next summer. But when you're trying to sleep in Saloy at night, it's a whole lot easier on your mind. Man, I wish I could have saved those people, wish I could have spared their lives, but hey, God and the King made it do it. It's all their fault. And what would happen if that storm hadn't come along? Rabeau had more men, he had more ships. What would he have done to the Spanish if he had caught them in Saloy? So that's how the area got its name, McKansas. Spanish for slaughter, for massacres, for slaughter. Now, we're going to get ready to go upstairs, do some, some exploring. We go up the stairway, though, we're going to hang out there for a moment. i got a couple safety notes for you. Safety note number one, please don't step on your little guys down here. Yeah, great, head on over the stairs. He's just a tough here, too. up there too. Step at the end right there. Yeah. Step down right here. Yep. Look, you got a pool table, man. Yeah. Looks like one, huh?